Okay. All your third installment of graph algebra. Okay. So um, today I want to mostly talk about some examples. But before I start, I want to um, impose a restriction on the kind of objects I'm working with. So last time I talked about these left canceling of small categories. So an extremely general setting to build CSER algebras from oriented combinatorial data. Um, but it's it gets pretty messy when the case is so general. So um, I'm going to restrict the time to look at it today um, first. So, um, so, so lambda is It's a little small category. Um, uh, there's a special kind that's easier to handle. And most of the examples people have treated have been of this kind. Uh, so lambda is what I call finitely aligned. Uh, if, um, say, for any pair of elements, uh, there is a finite set in lambda, call it F, such that um, the intersection of the principal ideal, principal right ideals defined by alpha and beta. Why am I putting parentheses around those? It's not necessary. Is the union of principal ideals uh, obtained from this finite collection of elements in F? So I learned last week that this idea is um, in the context of rings or well, more general algebraic kinds of settings. This is sometimes called, or even before we called it finitely aligned, it's called right house. And I think this originated in group theory, um, but it seems to predate the uh, operator algebra use. But I'll stick to finitely aligned because it's it's got a, an excellent pedigree from our subject. So in the case of higher rank graphs, this was what um, Rayburn, Sims, and Yee finally realized was the correct condition to give the correct Caesar algebra in the case of higher rank graphs. So I'm not planning to talk about higher rank graphs, um, but um, some of you may have be familiar with them and know some of that history. So in general, I think of left cancel of the small categories as a way to generalize higher rank graphs uh, and make it easier to work with them even if there are higher rank graphs, instead of the um, using all the structure that comes with those uh, objects. Okay, so if the uh, category is finitely aligned, um, then the analysis of well, construction of the locally compact house door space from lambda is actually much easier. The rest of the is easier. Um, okay, so. What is that? Um, okay, so we'll make definition. So subset. I'm just going to call it a little x of lambda is called um, hereditary. If, um, oh, I was going to define directly first, but I've got it all right here. This means that it, the easy way to think of it is closed under initial segments. So if we have an element of lambda, if an element of X, and it can be written as a composition alpha beta, then the initial part alpha must also belong to X. So if um, um, I'll write it this way, so alpha, Beta in X 
implies alphanumerics. And it's lambda is called directly that. That was a C. Okay, I'm going to try to print more carefully. And this is what directly might mean. If you have two elements of X, there should be a third element of X that extends both of those two. So we'll say um, alpha and beta in X. That's an X. Implies that um, there exists gamma. Let's, in fact, let's just say it this way. So principal ideal alpha lambda intersected principal ideal beta lambda intersected with X. Not so the order we get from the our notion of order in lambda when restricted to X is it makes it a direct set. And then it's just closed back under this uh, initial segment property. And then the um, theorem is that um, if we have this property, then um, this locally compact Hausdorff space lambda star, uh, the ultra filters, right? Now we can describe them more explicitly. This is exactly the collection of all directed hereditary sets. And in fact, um, the topology, um, so a, a base of open set, compact open. We look at um, um, alpha lambda. So again, these are um, constructible right ideal, constructible right ideals. But we are only have to look at subsets corresponding to those for alpha in this set. Um, let's see, so what am I describing? Maybe this isn't what I wanted to um, say right now. The point is that we can easily identify points in this set by looking for direct hereditary sets. And that's actually very doable in examples. Um, uh, another way of thinking of this is that um, a set with these properties is the correct analog of a finite or infinite path in a category of a path category of a graph. So these are. Okay, now, so um, maybe you remember last time I said that in our picture of lambda star as um, ultra filters in this ring of sets script capital A, uh, it's not at all clear what we would mean by the maximal elements. So it's not clear how to identify a boundary. 
But for now, of course, it is easy to say what's a maximal element because these sets are, these are subsets that um, can be ordered by inclusion. So um, we can define the boundary of lambda is the closure of the maximal elements. The maximal under inclusion directed on the red plane. And so we can let um, what I'll call C star of lambda. Uh, well, I don't really have a good, I guess I would say C zero of this boundary um, and loosely written as, I'll put again quotations because this isn't how I normally think of building a C star algebra. It's not clear what this cross product construction is, but in principle, there's some sort of construction like a cross product. And it's just restricting the functions we use to the boundary instead of all of lambda star because this, this analog of the concrete algebra. Are these individual directed hereditary sets uh, some sort of subcategory of? Uh, uh, subsets of uh, uh, subcategory of lambda such that if you construct some sort of C star algebra on top of them, would you get some sort of ideals? Because uh, we get the same in finite uh, row finite graphs that if you have hereditary and saturated subsets, you can uh, uh, construct ideals out of it. You're asking, yes. So the word hereditary is a red herring. So it's a it's a different use of it than in the case of uh, graph algebras. Yeah, but the definition yeah. seemed a bit similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So, um, it's true. It, it looks very similar. Um, of course, in the graph, in the graph, and graph case, we're really looking at vertices, and the paths are just connecting kind of vertices. But that. Yeah. But the direction is quite different. Actually. Yeah, for the directed one, it's very different. And um, and in fact, um, there's not really a way to, you know, so you can't really multiply these sets x in any sensible way. So if you if you think of in the case of a directed graph, um, these are exactly the um finite and infinite paths. Okay, of course, finite paths you can um, compose, but infinite. You can compose a finite path with an infinite path, but two infinite paths can't really be composed together. So it's a, it's a different situation, and it's not giving us ideals. So the hereditary saturated subset of the vertices, in the case of a directed graph, um, is really defining a certain subset of lambda star, an open subset that's invariant. If you look at the complement, then you would get the quotient by that idea. So it's, 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 a, it's a different notion, but it's somehow unfortunate that the same word comes in both. But it was Nika who made up these words, not me. So it's not my fault. And this is um, this is due to Nika. Of course, he was working in the context of monoids, submonoids, certain kinds of submonoids. Okay, so I really want to show you why finite alignment is such a good property, and I think you'll recognize this when I show you. So. Hmm. I guess I don't need to make that assumption. Okay, so let's um so we get this finite set F from the finite alignment. So um well we can always let's say it this way. So we can find a minimal
so hard to write. Okay, minimal, I'm not gonna rewrite this one. I'll try to write better in the future. Um, a finite set F with this um, property coming from the finite alignment. It's so alpha lambda intersect beta and the, it's the union over gamma and F, gamma lambda. And then in fact, F is almost unique, right? So if lambda has non-trivial inverses, you could always pre-multiply gamma by an invertible element at the source of gamma. And you'll get a new set that does the same thing. So in, in that case, we would tend to sort of mud out by the action of units on the left in a situation like this. We don't really have to worry about it. Uh, most examples that I'm interested in have no non-trivial inverses and it's not a problem, but um, it's enough to just think of it this way. So the minimality is modulo, um, not worrying about multiplying with more elements at a vertex. Now, what does this mean? It means that gamma is an extension of alpha and extension of beta. Each gamma is an extension of alpha and of beta. So we can write uh, gamma, let's write it as alpha times uh, another element, I'll call it alpha sub gamma. And we can also write it as beta times some element beta times gamma because gamma is a common extension. So now in the inverse monoid, so I'll just recall that capital I was the inverse monoid generated by the mappings left multiplication by alpha together with its inverse. So let's look at them. The map being defined by the pair alpha beta this way, alpha inverse composed with beta. Well, the only elements you can apply this to are elements, well, such that if we shift, add beta to the front, it then becomes possible to cancel an alpha, right? So it's only really things that are, um, uh, let's see, so I had a way of writing this that wasn't so confusing. Um, let's write it this way. So the domain of this, is the union of um, in order to be able to remove alpha after putting on beta, I have to have beta gamma. there for some gamma, so that beta, beta, gamma begins with alpha and it's possible to move down. So it's the only elements where you can actually apply this particular map. And that's because um, the only things that extend both alpha and beta are the extensions of these gammas. So now, um, let's make sure I put this up right. So I'll write this alpha beta, alpha inverse beta. I'm gonna write it in the following way. So it is the union over gamma. What I'm gonna do is um, for each gamma, I'm gonna put, put on and take off this extra bit. So I'll write this as alpha times alpha gamma times alpha gamma inverse. That's the fourth just alpha. And then I have beta, beta gamma, beta gamma inverse. A 
and now using the inverse to flip things around. It comes out alpha gamma, uh, alpha gamma inverse, alpha inverse. But this is the inverse is um alpha alpha gamma inverse. If of course that says gamma inverse. Right. We find alpha gamma to actually be what gives you back gamma. And likewise, this is gamma. So these two parts cancel each other. So really, we have the union over gamma of um, alpha gamma, beta gamma. So this means that in this inverse monoid, when an inverse of our mapping is composed with a direct mapping, we can always rewrite it by decomposing it in a finite number of pieces with the inverse on the right instead of on the left. So this is sometimes called a wick ordering principle in Prince Pew algebra. That sounds like quantum mechanics, right? Oh, I have no idea. I just know this buzz phrase, wick ordering. And what it really means is that um plus the would be well mutually adjoint operators, which are not reverse for each other, but it's but what it means is that if we're looking at the C star algebra of lambda, that's actually the closed span. Of um, terms of the form, say F mu S mu star. In the same way that anything in the inverse uh, semigroup I, it's a product of things like this, and each one can now be written in this form. Get products of these, you can continue to move the inverses through until every element of the inverse monoid is written in this form, a union of um, single um, terms uh, where the invert inverse of a element always occurs on the right. And then the theory of even the Kuntz algebra is the analysis really depended upon being able to write uh, a total set uh, as the span of elements like this. Multiply isometries, and then multiply adjoints of isometries. And you never have to put an adjoint on the left to left because it'll kill off something or else pass through. I mean, Kunskri algebra is, in fact, that's why uh, Rayburn, Sims, and Yi composed finite alignment because they wanted to preserve this property because it makes it so much easier to analyze. So, in fact, I remember asking A, we were sitting in a talk, and I said, why is it that we have to assume one and one instead of so that we can do this? Mm -hmm. But it's still quite a way to go to see what are basis elements. What are what basis are elements? Um, oh, I mean, these things count. Yeah. Okay. I mean, everything, is, this is the span, all right, but they're not linearly independent. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Yeah. But um, knowing how they multiply, it's very easy to study this. Okay, very easy. Uh, uh, it's possible. Let's say possible, possible, yes. Yes, I agree with possible, yes. So, in fact, now um, I know, and other people have realized that uh, the non finite ley line case can also be tractable. So, it's more complicated. Um, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. But I was very happy to uh, do in my class uh, a proof of what the linear basis is for, you know, like mm -hmm. graph algebra or Schalder basis for graph sister algebra. Because then I realized what actually this basis is. It's extremely non-canonical. I mean, at each step you make some choices, and 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 sort of the algorithm is natural, okay, 
but, but then basically you, you, each time you have a vertex which is regular, you know, finite emitter, non, 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 not a sink, then uh, you, really, you really have to make some choices. And, and uh, each choice will give you a different basis. So I was happy to do a proof because then I, only then I realized what the basis really is. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, and it's important to realize that uh, just like any time you want a basis, it's not canonical. Yeah. Unless there's some other structure around that picks that for you. Exactly, like scalar product on it. Yeah, so it's helps. Okay, so that's actually it. Um, but the span is natural when you give it by internet relation, it's kind of obvious that that's a span of such words. Okay, so now I, I want to start giving you some examples. Um, and I want to use this method I've been describing to go at the Caesar algebra. So my first example is actually a higher rank graph, but it's a very elementary one. Um, and we'll see, it's not hard to take it apart. Um, so maybe for this one, I'll use colors. Mm -hmm. So it, it's common when uh, drawing higher rank graphs to use different colors for the different degrees. But we don't really have to worry about that because it's just going to be um, uh, left hand side of a small category. So it'll be a directed graph with cer certain identifications. And the identifications will be so basic that it won't be hard to see what we get. So. Um, oh, so before I go to blue, let's draw the vertices in black. So there's a sequence of vertices, V1, V2, V3. Um, that'll be enough. And then we have two colors of edges. We have blue edges like this. And of course, continuing. So these are all alpha 1, alpha 2, and so on. And I guess the other canonical color is red. So this is eta one, eta two, and so on. So that's it. That's our graph. Now, what are the identifications? So we insist that the composition alpha i, eta i plus one. Seems important enough to draw properly if I can to be equal to beta i alpha i plus one. Now, what does this mean, uh, for example? Alpha one, beta two, alpha three, beta four. Well, we can interchange the middle two. So this is alpha one, alpha two, beta three, beta four. Or we could have um, changed the last two. Alpha one, beta two, beta three, alpha four, uh, and, and so on. There are many different ways to write the same element. And so you see, really all that matters is of our four edges, how many of them are labeled alpha and how many are labeled beta. And the order in which you present them will tell you what the subscript will be and it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we might say, I'll say V1 lambda V, n plus one. So these are all the elements of lambda whose range is V1 and whose source is V n plus one, which means there are n of these edges. And the only choice we have here is how many of those n edges are labeled alpha and how many are labeled beta. So it's convenient to describe these as I'll just write V1 to remind us where the range is. And then we can say alpha to the i beta to the n minus i, where um, i is between zero and 
But even though there are two to the n different paths in the directed graph, there are only n plus one paths between these vertices in this particular but again, it's a little small cat. So it's really much more elementary than even the directed graph. Now, something I um, I might have alluded to before, I can't remember, but um, I'm only going to look at paths in lambda whose range is V1. So it turns out that if you, uh, within lambda star, if you look at only the directed hereditary sets whose range is V1, that gives you a transversal. It's a closed subset of, of lambda star. And under the action, every every element is equivalent to one of those. So there are basic principles in the C-star algebra theory that tell us that the C-star algebra we build by restricting to those elements will be Marita equivalent to the full thing that we would get with no restriction. Okay, now that's a technical bit of C-star theory, which isn't important for us to go through now, but it's the reason I'm gonna simplify the discussion by only considering elements of lambda whose range is V1. So okay, let me make that a, a statement. So. Also, will be a Morita equivalent when we we get from the whole of the star. A marine equivalence is um, in many, many, many situations in C-star algebra, it's the right notion of equivalence. It's more important to check marine equivalence than to worry about actual star isomorphism for certain kinds of questions. So, um, So what is uh, if you remember I um last time we saw that all the constructions we attach to lambda are fibered over the units of lambda. So the, the ring A is really the disjoint union of the rings A sub V, where V is the sub basically whose range is V. So really, I'm just looking at the AV1. And so I'm looking at directed hereditary sets. Well, two elements can only have a common extension if their ranges are the same. So we're only looking at elements whose range is V1, and that's a reasonable subject of that to start with. So let's find all these directed hereditary sets. So um, uh, what are they? Right, so here's how we can describe it. So let's consider a typical element X. A directed hereditary set, all of whose elements have range V1. Let's let M be the supremum of non-negative integers I, let's say. The element alpha to the i, say v1 alpha to the i. Let's do it. The element. Of course, if alpha to the i is an element of x, then so is alpha to the i minus one, this is its initial statement. So all that really matters is what's the biggest power of alpha that I can get into X. 
And we'll similarly let n be the suprema for beta. But these numbers belong to the natural numbers together with infinity. Maybe there's an, all powers of alpha belong to it. Now, of course, if I'm alpha, to, if, if I is less than or equal to M and J is less than or equal to N, so that alpha to the I and beta to the J both belong to X, then they only have one minimal common extension alpha to the i, beta to the j. So that's the only element extending both that has to belong to x because it's directed at hereditary. So. Alpha to the i, beta to the j belong to x. And alpha to the i, beta to the j. I notice you may notice I'm dropping the V1 now because it's we can consider it understood since we're only working with things. So now we can write down exactly what the elements of X are. Here, when I think of it, I'll put a V1. So um, Alpha to the i, beta to the j, where i is less than or equal to m, and j is less than or equal to n. So every directed hereditary set is determined by this pair of numbers m and n, extended natural numbers. So if, for example, i were equal to infinity, well, that means we have infinitely many alphas, but of course you have to put betas in as well. So um, this is a reason why directed hereditary sets are better than infinite paths. So um, uh, V1 alpha infinity, let's look at the biggest possible element, alpha infinity, beta infinity. We can think of that as um, alpha one, beta two, alpha three, beta four, or as um, alpha one, alpha two, beta three, oops. Ah, used to smudging things away with my finger. Uh, alpha four, alpha five, beta six, and so on. So it doesn't matter how you order these things as long as there's infinitely many of both kinds. Um, now, if you try to write down infinite paths, you'll be wondering, well, what do I really mean by these things? Uh, and the point is that the word infinite path kind of leads you to think about a certain kind of construction which doesn't always make sense. Okay, so I think um, so really I'm just going to um, um, write this in the form of V1 alpha to the m, beta to the n. So it's convenient just to write this um, to mean the element of uh, lambda star instead of the actual path itself. Now, so there's equivalence, right? So that you can identify. Um, well, so um, there is an element of lambda that looks like this, mm -hmm. as long as m and n are finite. So when M and N are both finite, then I'm using it's a representative. The representative of yeah. us. But um, yeah, you might say this in that case. This is the maximum element, and that would be a finite directed hereditary set. The infinite director, directed hereditary sets are the ones where one or both of the M and N are equal to infinity. Okay, what are the maximal elements? So. Um, so I, I have a different notation, but I'm just going to call this max for, um, because that's probably intelligible. I should probably make them the big one. Yep. 
there's only one maximal element, the biggest one. So points are closed. So this is actually equal to the boundary in this case. So we have a one point boundary for this um, left cancel for the small category. Now, what are the dynamics on this thing? So if you think of um, one of these paths, um, um, so, what elements of our inverse semigroup act on, say, x equals v1 alpha infinity beta infinity? Well, what can we do? Um, we can't add something to the beginning because V1 is the left end of our category. So the best we can do is remove something. So we can remove alpha or we can remove theta. Now, once we've done that, then a new element begins at V2. And so to get back into V1 lambda, we have to put either alpha or beta back. So the elements acting on points like this are all powers of a single element, so a single generator. We might take to be um, alpha one inverse beta one. So you can remove a beta, but we write this so that beta one's in front, doesn't really matter, remove it, put alpha one in. We still have infinitely many of both. So this um, takes this element X to itself. And that's the only, this and its powers are the only elements we have. So what this means is in the C-star algebra, the C-star algebra at the boundary is generated by a single unitary element. So the C-star algebra of, um, I'll say lambda, well, I'm just gonna write V1 lambda. There's not a, um, a good notation for me at the moment. And I'll just say this is sort of ad hoc notation for the moment is um, uh, the C star algebra of a single unitary corresponding to this one um, homeomorphism of a single point. So this is continuous functions on the surface. If you're familiar with um, high rate graphs and C-star algebras, and you recognize this lambda as a two graph, you probably recognize that its C-star algebra is the tensor product of C of T with the compact operator. So what we've done by restricting to uh, V1 is cut down to the projection at V1, which gives us just the C of T. That's how the compact operators to a simple projection. That's the real equivalent. It's not um, important to worry about. So this isn't really interesting enough to tell us about that lambda. That lambda has a little more structure than just popping out continuous functions on the circle. So instead of using the boundary, we could use some other closed invariant subset of lambda star. Let's take a look at what lambda star is in general, the whole thing. Okay, so what is um, E1 lambda star? Okay, well, we saw that the set of all V1 alpha to the N, beta to the N. In fact, I want to draw a picture of this, and I need a little more space for that. Look, here's a picture of them. 
I'm going to start here with um, just V1 itself, right? That's the path of length zero. And then I can look at um, uh, alpha, alpha squared, and I'm omitting the V1 at the front. I could have the length one path beta, alpha beta. Sorry, alpha squared beta. Beta squared. Alpha beta squared, alpha squared beta squared, alpha cubed beta squared, and so on. Right? So these are all the finite um, directed hereditary sets. Now, if we look at the union of these, at the end we have um, alpha infinity, alpha infinity beta, alpha infinity beta squared. Up top we have um, beta infinity, alpha beta infinity, alpha squared beta infinity. So these are all the infinite directed hereditary sets that have only finitely many alphas. So the, there's a maximum length number of alphas you could have inside an element. These are the same thing, infinite elements that have only finitely many occurrences of beta. And then in the upper corner, there's the one maximal element that has infinite many of both. So this part, that's just a copy of lambda. Well, V1 lambda. The rest of it is um, V1 lambda. Oh, I guess I should change colors. The rest of it is um, V1 lambda infinity, all the infinite directed hereditary sets. That's the complement. And this particular one, this is a uh, boundary of lambda, V1 boundary of lambda. Now, what is this element, alpha 1 inverse beta 1? This the only non-trivial element we have in the inverse semigroup to act on these things. Um, well, let's look at, oh, I should say this is an open. Open set in V1 lambda star. So the infinite part is a closed subset, invariant, right? If you, okay, here we, um, what do we do? We um, put on beta, that's okay. We still have beta infinity. We can't take off alpha though, because there isn't one there. We can put on beta here without changing anything. And then we can take off alpha. So the action of alpha one inverse beta one is really um, shifting this way. And 
this is not in the domain. Likewise here, um, you can put on beta one, that doesn't matter, that shifts us up. Removing alpha one doesn't do anything. So the action is to shift upward on this side. And of course, this is a fixed point as we already saw. Now, uh, what's the topology on all of this? Well, this is all discrete, but each column converges to the point at the top and each row converges to the point at the side. So if we throw away lambda itself and look just at the infinite part, that's a closed, relatively closed subset, or it's a closed subset within itself. Um, and there, all these points are discrete elements and they converge to this one. So if we let our element act on the infinite elements, we really have um, what looks like the unilateral shift because alpha infinity is not in the range. But and here we have the adjoint of the unilateral shift because it moves things down. It's surjective, but it kills the first phase of them. So if we look at, um, uh, in this case, C of V1 lambda infinity, and we let it act by um, this element. Mm, Z is maybe wrong object. It's really a natural numbers. And this is just the C star algebra generated by the unilateral shift direct sum with its edge. So we can represent this action on little L2 of this part. So this element being in the closure, we don't have to actually use it in our Hilbert space. And then uh, this guy is exactly shifting uh, forward here and backwards here. So we could even say that we have a short exact sequence. So the ideal in here is compact, direct sum compact, one copy for each of the sum ends. And then we have our um, uh, T star X direct sum S star C of T. Oops, you told me I shouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I did that. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, can you keep going? So why don't you touch this double arrow so that this vanishes? Oh. At the top, at the top. And no, 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 a bit lower. At the top of the symbols here. Yes. Okay. And at least it's... Oh, it okay. leaves the dot. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we do get something interesting when we enlarge our space away from the boundary. So this is what I mean, that um, the whole diagram will give us the Toplitz algebra. The boundary gives us the Kuntz-Krieger algebra. But in some situations, neither of those might be what we actually want to look at. And it turns out, as we'll see later, this is the right one to look at. So, okay. Now, but it looks like the published uh, sphere, like the generic published practice yeah. sphere. Yeah, so yeah. it's separate. Well, I hope you have something good to say about what I say later. Get these relations. Uh, and let me just say that um, if we use the entire picture and look at all of lambda star, then we'll have an ideal looking like the compacts on L2 of lambda coming from this open set. And the quotient of the Toplitz algebra, that copy of compacts, will be um, this one, which itself is an extension. So it's a kind of two stage. Step uh, type one, two stars. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. But can I ask uh, yeah. when you when you do this sort of construction, what kind of structure do you expect to have generally? I mean, do you always get something nuclear, for example? Uh, no. Okay. No. It's like if you have a um, uh, say a, a monoid even a submonad of a group, I guess you don't always expect to get a nuclear system. Sure, so you, you might not even get something exact. 
possible. Oh yes. Well, that's right. Yeah, right. So I think this um this kind of lambda includes all left cancellative monoids, even if they don't embed in groups. So it's just <laughs> big to be able to all right. really say something intelligible about all of them. Yeah, yeah. More in special cases. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, no, that's that's absolutely right. Um, here, what's really going on is um, this is as opposite from monoid structures you can get in the sense that there's no element that has the same source and range. There's no kind of loop in this picture, which is where you start getting much more complicated behavior. And a monoid, of course, everything has the same source and range. So it's the kind of opposite picture. Sometimes you could think of this as um, stretching out your monoid to make it no longer the same thing, but it gives you something easier to look at that sometimes has advantages also. And as in the case of higher rank graphs, if your left cancel in a small category comes with some extra structure, then maybe you can say some more about it. But I think even, even the finite alignment is not enough in general to give you something good. Easier to analyze, but it still may not be exact. Of course, that's um, maybe only Gromov could find a non-exact one. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but it's not a, a, nothing would be assumed. And just a few days ago, Misha Gromov gave, gave a talk in St. Louis, and he was very angry that nobody asked any questions. Yeah, well, What's wrong with you? You're not asking any questions. <laughs> Yeah, when you invite a ringer to talk, you have to invite a ringer to be in the audience too. <laughs> okay, I'd like to move on to a different set of examples that will build on this one. But before I do those, I need to remind you about the Efro Shen algebras. So this is um, a recall. Um, He first was in LA, right? UCLA. Yeah. Well, no, he was first in uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. Then he moved. I mean, this was a seismic shift in operating modules when FOS moved from the East Coast to the West. <laughs> yeah, but no, he was a long, long time in London. Okay, so what are these? Um, these are sometimes also called um, continued fraction. Yeah, so here's how they come about. Um, so we start with an element T, an irrational number in the interval. And um, classically, T can be uniquely written as a simple continued fraction. So we can write T as the one over A1 plus one over I. So here are the um, these are positive integers. And this is a unique expression. And we um, abbreviate this um, in this form zero. So we use the square brackets zero because there's no integer part. And then we um, just list, list these um, numbers, A1, A2. That's our notation for this infinite union fraction. So these numbers A, I, are, well, in some places where I learned this stuff, they're called partial quotients. But if we stop this after a finite number of steps, we get what are called the partial convergence. So um, if we look at just the continued fraction from A1 
up to say a n. So this is finite continued fraction. Um, this can be written in, in reduced form as a fraction, so Pn over Qn. And then there's a classical um, recurrence relation for these um, Pn and Qn, the numerator and denominator. So P0 is 0, P1 is 1, and um, Pn is An, Pn minus 1 plus P n minus two. And the QNs behave almost the same. So Q zero is one, U one is A one, and QN has the same formula. A n, Q n minus one, Q. So you can work out what these are, but in fact, you can even compute a this relation and find exactly these fractions. So um, what did Afros and Chen do? Um, they um, define embeddings, say for M, Q, N minus one, direct sum M, Q, N minus two, into M, Q, N, by uh, using these recurrence formulas. So we might take something like say, little a direct sum little b, the direct sum of two matrices. Um, this qn is a n times this size plus this size. So we can map this to a matrix of size qn by sending a down the diagonal I guess A is not a good choice of letter. I'm stepping so um, A n times and then B. That's a unital embedding of this finite dimensional C star algebra into this one. So the Efrosten algebra, A sub T, is defined to be the union. I guess we could go from, well, it doesn't really matter, one to infinity. It's, and then close that. Well, it's an approximately finite dimensional C structure, the closure of an increasing union of finite dimensional C And um, AT is. So this is um, Elliot. The first instance of the Elliot program was his classification of AF algebras. This is the unique um, AF, well, simple AF algebra. Yeah. A zero is um think of it as v plus p e times v as a dense subgroup of the reals. So of course that's just isomorphic to z squared. Positive cone in the k zero group is uh, the intersection of this with positive numbers. And the third part of the invariant for AF algebras is the class of the identity element in K0, just the number one of the reals. Then some people are. So um, this ordered group is what is called a dimension group. And those are in one to one correspondence with. AF algebras up to the position of the image, which is kind of a real 
Now, in fact, um, uh, uh, it was who did this? Handelman, Shen, Efros, um, I forget who all exactly was involved, but characterizing the dimension groups abstractly as order, unperforated ordered abelian groups with the recent interpolation property. Okay, we don't have to really go into this, but um, realizing that this is one of these groups, the theorem tells us that it can be written as an inductive limit of simplicial groups, z to the finite, uh, finally generated abelian groups for the usual um, first quadrant order. And so what Efros and Chen did is show how uh, these recursion relations allow you to realize such an inductive limit system, which then tells you how to build the other dimensional system. Like this. Okay, I guess I don't really need to say anything more about that. I just want you to keep these examples in mind. Now I'm going to change gears and talk about a new family of left cancelable small categories. Um, so these are more examples. And this is now joint work with um, my former PhD student, uh, Ian Mitcher. So um, now, if I were clever, I could go back and copy the previous um, diagram. Is that possible? I know how to select it. Is it easy to copy what you've selected? I never tried it. Try. Select it. Now select how to copy. Where is copy? I don't know. Okay, so we need more lessons with tech people. So I'll just draw it again. Um, Stick with life for us. Oops. We had a B1. I drew blue edges. One, two. But it's usually easier to do things by hand than being clever, isn't that right? So um, what we do is we add more edges to this picture. So I'm going to put edges here. But there are actually several edges potentially that add in each place. So I'm going to call these gamma, so gamma one. But now there's a superscript tell us which of various edges there are. So there are multiple black edges between each pair of vertices. This is gamma two, J two, and so on. So here, um, J I is less than or equal to some fixed number ki. So we have a family of pictures, one for each sequence of numbers ki. So um, this k, I think of as the sequence ki infinity. It's an element of n to the infinity. So the ki's are allowed to be zero. So there might be a pair of these vertices where there are no extra edges between them. But we insist that um, um, ki 
be positive infinitely often. We're really doing something essential. Now, we still have um, relations uh, that we know from before. I'm not changing that. So alpha i, beta i plus one is beta i, alpha i plus one. The red and blue edges behave just like we've been talking about all along, but there are no new relations. So there's no um, identifications between the red and blue edges and any of the black. So in particular now, even though the original part was a two graph, mm -hmm. this is not a higher rank graph, mm -hmm. kind. but it's completely easy to write down and think about, it turns out. So originally I, um, I had made Ian read my paper and then I said, okay, well, what's the easiest example we can think of just to try to see if we can compute what any of this stuff is. I put one edge, one extra edge between every pair of vertices. And we talked about it for a while, and then he went away and came back and said, the golden ratio was hiding inside. So then we realized that we accidentally stumbled on something interesting. And it took a lot of work, but eventually, so he wrote his thesis on a special case, uh, a large family of special cases, but then we did the general case together, and we realized you have to allow for multiple edges as well as possibly no edges. So here's um, the theorem. So the day in parentheses is the number of edges. Sorry? Day in parentheses is the number of edges. Day in parentheses is which of the extra edges? So there are K1 new edges here. Uh -huh. So label gamma 1 upper 1, gamma 1, uh -huh. gamma 1 upper 3, up to gamma 1 upper K1. Right, so let's write this. Oh, okay. Gamma one, J one. So there is K I edges, right? And all of them are black colored. Sorry? And all of them are black colored. Or for each individual J one, uh, they are differently colored. Yeah, yeah. So this is an element of the set. Gamma one upper one, gamma one upper two, it's going up to gamma one upper, and then K one. That's the biggest index you can have there because that tells us how many extra edges we have from B2 to B1. So we have to have a new index telling us which are the possible edges between B3 and B2 we're using. So um, there's a very little choice you have here get between two vertices, just how many edges are you using alpha, how many beta. But here, in each place, you have to say which of the possible edges you're using. Okay, so here's um, the theorem, uh, proved in some cases by Ian and then in general by the two of us. Uh, okay, so we um, find the following infinite continued fractions so 0, 1, A1, 1, A2, 1. And now, because the KI might be zero, some of them, this is not a simple continued fraction, not using only positive integers. This is a non simple continued fraction, but in fact, the the ones in every other place mean that it really does converge still. So this is, so T is a convergent, but non-simple. Continued fraction. So that's maybe the first statement. Second statement is uh, the C star algebra. Um, now again, um, we look at, basically we build the C star algebra and cut it down to the projection at the first vertex. 
to get something more either equivalent to the whole thing. So as before, that's what I'm going to do. Only consider things whose range is the So I'm using this as a sort of uh, sloppy notation for that. Thing. So this C star algebra is exactly isomorphic to the F Roshan algebra AG. So that's the miracle that came out of this. Uh, so a third fact is that um, um, every T, so irrational number in the unit interval, um, has a unique um, continued fraction expansion of this form. Oh, it's a, a new, uh, okay, new to us, certainly, um, way of expressing uh, real numbers by continued fractions in this way. So when you say of this form, you mean alternating ones? Yes, exactly like this, where we let like ki be a sequence of natural numbers that's non-zero infinitely often. We build this particular thing with the alternating ones. Every irrational real number in the interval can be expressed that way in one and all. Exactly. So, uh, a couple of remarks. So, this is a, um, a very different. Picture of AT. And the reason I say this is it really comes from the groupoid underlying this. But we can see that from the, remember we had this one element of the inverse semigroup for the red and blue stuff that could act on path. Right? So we have this um, alpha one inverse beta one acting on V1 alpha infinity, beta infinity. And we got back that same point. This means that the groupoid underlying the algebra has non-trivial isotropy at this point. Okay, and I'm not talking about groupoids, but in fact, um, between the, once we have the space lambda star, that's the unit space of the groupoid, and we'll build the groupoid, that's a convenient way to pass to a sister algebra. So the groupoid um, has um, non trivial isotopy. So it's um, not an AF groupoid. AF groupoids are actually principal. And if you write the Afrosian algebra in the usual way as a groupoid C star algebra, this was done by Renault in his book, then it will be an AF groupoid. So it's a very different kind of trivial algebra. Let's see. So um, let me just make um, another remark. Uh, so the proof has the following steps. Uh, let's see. So we have to calculate the Elian invariant. All right. So what we build is a certain C star algebra. And to identify it, we have to compute its K theory, um, positive cone, position of unit, traces, pairing, things like this. Um, let's see. We um, uh, check. And it's classifiable. Now there's a powerful super theorem class of viable. Is if this Caesar algebra is classifiable, then you can identify it by finding the Elian variant. 
And then we um, appeal to the magic theorem. That um, I think the sort of final form is, it's not K, decreases white in winter. But of course, that came only after infinitely many other people have worked on this problem. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a mass effort by many, many brilliant people. So oh, it sounds amazing. I mean, in practice, how do you check that it's classifiable? Did you, you don't, you're not actually checking that's an AF algebra, just that it's classifiable, and then it turns out to be an AF algebra. That's right. So we were unable to verify AF directly, but we proved that it's simple, separable, unital, nuclear, satisfies UCT. And, and has finite nuclear dimension. Right. So, uh, okay. so this is usually the stumbling point. Yeah. In our example, in these examples, that actually turned out to be easy once we had, in order to calculate the Elliott invariant, we had to actually write it as an inductive limit of subalgebras, just not finite dimensional mm -hmm. things. But those were the kind of thing we saw before, a kind of extension of a fixed length from more elementary pieces. So we could easily compute nuclear dimension of those like right. the bounds of inductive limit. Right, right. Yeah. So it was actually part of the analysis gave us nuclear, finite nuclear dimension for free, which is um, uh, a lucky break. That's, yeah. I don't even know how anyone would check Z stability directly. It just seems. So, but it also means that um, the proof of the theorem is somehow non-constructive. Right? We can't actually find the approximating family of dimensional. We couldn't. There's an obvious candidate. It looks just like the approximating family for the Groschen algebra, and it sits inside there in the right way, but it's not the whole thing. You don't get the unit space. So it's actually somehow interesting that the Classification theorem came along just at the right time, a little bit before we were doing our work. Um, so I want to take a slight detour, detour away from the irrational numbers to the rational numbers. So Suppose we have a rational number t. Okay, the classical theory says that um, t has um, two, exactly two um, distinct. So distinct is the same as exactly, right? Two distinct um, finite, simple, continued fraction. And so the point is that the, uh, every real number has a continued fraction, simple continued fraction expansion. And if you have a rational number, the expansion stops after some point. So you get a finite. So for example, if this is uh, 0, a1, a2, an. Well, well, the very end of the continued fraction is one over a n. If you write a n as a n minus one plus one, then that plus one is plus one over one, and you see that this is the same as so it's called the a n minus one, then use a n one less, and then one. So these are the two. Okay, if an happened to be one, then you would just, if you had a one here, you would just add it on to an minus one. Now there are two. Now, if you um, look at the um, Efros Shen construction of matrix algebras, it means there are two finite dimensional. These 
we might call them um, the M U N X on M U N minus one. Right. So if we do this and look at the um, convergence, there'll be a final one, P N over Q N, and a penultimate one, and we use those two denominators. Um, but if you use this different expansion, you'll get a well, the same QN, because that's the denominator of the fraction P, but the QN minus one will be different. And QN. Um, so if we want to fill in algebras at the rational numbers amongst the Efrochen algebras at the irrational and there really isn't the reason to pick one of these over the other. You really should use both of them. And it turns out that um, one of them is a kind of a pro is related to an approximation of t from below, and the other with approximation of t from above. So I think what happens is um, if n is even, then this one corresponds to well, whichever one has um, ends with an even subscript, that's the approximation from above. One with an odd subscript is the approximation from below. Um, and so, what that means is we should really have two algebras at each rational number. So, so for t in, let's say, zero, let's so take the open interval q. Um, we have, um, say, a t plus. A P minus. So we should um, um but um I'm just gonna call this X for convenience the um say zero one disconnected at points of um the rational points. But this is a usual thing you do with a uh, an interval, you get an accountable set of points, break it and put in two points, and you get a cancer set. Right? So this is a, because we're not dealing with the endpoints, this is um, a locally compact house store uh, cancer set. So I think it was X is, um, it's like zero, one minus Q, so the irrational numbers together with, Set of all um, t plus t minus so for, um, t rational point. And now we have an algebra sitting above every point, so we can make this bundle. Which um. We have a C star bundle. And it's not hard to see that it's actually continuous as a C star bundle. I don't want to go into the details of this, but it's um it would be interesting to have continuous C star bundles. And there are some other questions to ask about that. But of course, it's not quite satisfactory because we really want um, a bundle over the integral. So, that's sort of the classical picture. Now let's go back to the picture that Ian and I found. So, uh, turns out that we can do the same thing in that context. Oh, so let's let. Like KD a sequence of non negative integers. And um, let's um, suppose, say that um, KM is positive and KI is zero for I greater than M. So exactly one of the sequences that wasn't in the collection we used before. We can still form our um, 
uh, infinite continued fraction. But of course, this uh, eventually ends with uh, one zero one zero one zero one zero zero one a one 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 a m one zero one zero. And the fact is that um, this tail of one zero one zero one zero contributes nothing, and so if you look at the finite portions and to try to take a limit, uh, you can do this on the uh, the circle, right? The real line with point and infinity. These are all done with fractional linear transformations, and you find that it converges to just the, the finite continued fraction. Now, of course, there may be zeros in here in various places, but you can reduce this to a simple finite continued fraction. And it turns out you always get a simple finite continued fraction whose left index is even. So this process is really picking one of the two possible continued fraction expansions for you. So um, uh, eliminate, I won't go into this, but. You know, zeros. He looks an even um, simple finite. So, in my mind, that's the second miracle. It's that something's making. Uh, an arbitrary choice for, for us. The price we pay for that is the algebra we get for such a K is no longer finite dimensional, like two we had before. Okay, so the construction. Lambda. Works uh, for these days. Right. So now, if you think of our picture, the, the black edges stop at some point when the ki's become zero. There are no extra edges between vertices where k sub i is zero. And from that point onward, it's just the red blue stuff that we had before. So it's a much more elementary kind of. Um, Left hand to the small category. Let's see how oh, it's going to describe this. So, um, what's the boundary of lambda in this case? All right. So. The director of hereditary sets can only involve finitely many black edges because at some point you run out of them. And then it's exactly what we had before between the red and the blue. There are finitely many ways to arrange the beginning, depending on which black edge you use. But after that, we have exactly the kind of ends that we had before this countable family. So the boundary of lambda is a finite set. A B1 boundary is finite. Right? Uh, typical elements look like um, B1, and then we have some stuff, um, I'll say mu, some finite path, and then alpha to the M, beta to the N, where I'm. Well, no, if it's a. Um, boundary path, it has to be alpha infinity beta to the infinity. Got to be maximal. You can't be that you can add more stuff on the end if either of these exponents were finite. So there are only finitely many mu's 
that you can use because there are only finitely many edges that are, are um, alpha or beta. So this means that it's not so far away from what we got in our previous example. With when, that's the example when Ki is identically zero. Okay. So what we end up with here is our, um, So again, looking only at the infinite directed hereditary sets, um, we still have compacts, direct sum compacts as an ideal. And now the quotient is some size matrix over C of T. So here's where I'm. I talked with Mari about this a bit in May. And um, at, for a little while, I thought that I could realize this as a graph algebra. And then I thought about it more and decided that I couldn't. And I wanted to prove that it wasn't a graph algebra and I couldn't do that either. So this is somehow a, a funny question um, that comes up. Now, how do you describe what extension this is? Huh. It's a very good, sorry to, to jump in, but this is a very good question. Uh, but as looking at it from the point of view of pullbacks, right? you know, pullbacks, yeah, exactly. exact sequences are strictly related. And, and uh, I, it's really not clear to me what conditions. So imagine that you have uh, just a, a triple of graph sister algebras, and you have some morphisms which define the pullback sister algebra. What are the conditions on these morphisms to guarantee that the pullback sister algebra is a graph sister algebra? Yeah, so. And, 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 and you can vary it. Uh, this is how we discovered your quantum spheres. And Wojtek Szymanski proved they are not even Momorita equivalent. Right? They are not uh, grass Easter uh -huh. and, and for me, this was astounding because the only difference is that you have a tepid algebra and tepid algebra, and we put it together with a circle algebra. So, okay. If you do it the usual way, get the Polish, generic Polish quantum sphere, which of course is a grass Easter algebra. Uh -huh. But then you just uh, say that you map your generating isometry to the inverse of the unitary. And that's it. You get something which is not then Morita equivalent to Podlash. And it's definitely not a graph system. Yeah. So um, to identify this, we might look at the index map. Right here we have uh, the K1 group is given by uh, an integer telling us the winding number of our function in here. And that'll be mapped to some element of K0, which is Z direct some Z. So in this case, the index uh, maps, say, the class of, so loosely writing a class of Z. This would be Z under a rank one projection and direct sum with one on the rest of it. Um, this is uh, minus one, one. Because it's essentially the, direct, the unilateral shift direct sum its edge length. Uh, and the other element of this, is the kind of, right, when you lift, so MN tensor one, the matrix algebra sits inside here as a unit of subalgebra. So within here, we have an extension of MN by K direct sum K. And then there's a pair of um, defect indices, which an extension. And they're um, actually related in order to identify the isomorphism type of the c -star algebra. So that's another um, element of the class. So we can describe exactly what c -star algebra show up here. And, uh, and I would love to know if they're graph algebras. Um, so I think they're not, but um, that doesn't seem like such an easy. I have look at um, Mr. Matthew's Wojtek's paper. Yeah, 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 it was about mere quantum spheres. It's, yeah. I, I think they have it in Comprendi. Uh, -huh. uh I ask an unrelated question because remember that in this context, when Wojtek was defining, you know, quantum double suspension. He uh, used the Busby invariant. Is this the Busby invariant? Busby invariant. Is it somehow related to that? Yeah. Well, so when I said a moment ago, this is actually a subtle point. It took me a while to realize. So uh -huh. uh, I was interested in what C star algebra comes up here because yes. this is the algebra we're going to put at the rational number t. Right? That's my replacement for the final dimensional things we get using the fraction. So now the Busby invariant classifies the extension, not yes. the algebra. Uh huh. Uh, so it's more. Yeah. So this. So the Busby invariant includes the index, but also we have to have mm -hmm. both uh, defect indices. Okay. 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 Well, the isomorphism type is a little coarser. Yeah. Oh, so much. Yes. Yes. 
Now, it's a really important point that took me a long time to realize I had to look at when understanding this one. Okay. Um, so, the next thing to notice is now that we have this interpretation for rational numbers, we have a map I'm calling pi from the space y I think of as um, natural numbers infinity. So all infinite sequences of natural numbers. Now allowing uh, that only finitely many of them might be non-zero. In fact, that zero sequences in there as well. And now we have a map from this component pi to um, the half open interval. And what it does is it takes um, this um, potentially non-simple infinite computing fashion. So this map pi is bijective. Right, but it will always be Russian, right? No, no, this is an infinite commute fashion. So if the sequence so that's finitely no, 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 if the sequence ki, it could be any sequence. Uh -huh. so if it's infinitely non-zero, uh -huh. then you'll get an irrational. Okay. If it's only finitely non-zero, you get a rational. Because I, I thought that you said there's an infinity means that only finitely no, 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 no. This includes the sequence that are only finitely. Non -zero. Okay. Okay. But in all sequences in that. I missed includes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. So no, I know it's it's, it's actually um well known how to take something like this and make it equivalent to the irrational numbers. This is a, mm -hmm. a way of identifying the Polish topology on the mm -hmm. irrational numbers. But that's when you use only um, non-zero sequences in a certain way with this ordinary simple continuum fractions. So here I want to include the rational numbers too. So we allow um, zeros as well as non-zeros. And we use a different continued fraction expansion, and then we get all the numbers that we have. But of course, this can't be a homeomorphism. <laughs> so it's bijective, it's continuous. And the inverse map is continuous from the right. That's sort of surprising. But from the left, it's um, horribly discontinuous. Sorry, can you explain what it means continuous from left or right? Yeah, so pi inverse goes the other way around. Yes. So if we have a point here, if you approach it with a point from the right, pi inverse, ah. the points converge to pi. Okay, because you mean it's on the interval. Okay, I got you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, so, well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And at zero, you can come to the right. Of course, at zero, you can't check the non continuity yeah. for the left. Yeah. Yes, So um, I want to um, explain what this map pi means in a way that makes this representation of real numbers um, seem very natural. I think that's surprising because this representation came by accident from writing down this particular left cancel small category that we had no reason to expect at any particular interest. So um, I think this is also interesting. So let's just say, um, uh, what does map pi? Okay, I don't know what I mean by the phrase mean, what does it mean, but I wanted to show you something about it. Okay, so I want to talk about generators of these algebras we get from these left cancel of small categories. So let's let um, um, mu and nu 
So these are supposed to be elements of such a category. Well, maybe I'll even write it. Um, right, so if you go from Vn plus one to V1, they must be of length N. So mu I and nu I belong to the set, or well, either alpha I, beta I, or gamma I, upper J. So this is a little strange, but I don't have a particular sequence Ki in mind when I write lambda. So let's just write it as a typical kind of thing that might show up in one of these lambdas, but I'm not saying there's a limit on what J is, just you pick something like this. And I wanna consider uh, the element, say S mu, S nu star. And the question is um, for which K in that space Y, is this element S mu, S nu star, an element of my C star algebra? So I'm looking at starting at V1, I'll write lambda of K indicate the dependence on K. And I'm again, restricting to the infinite directed hereditary paths instead of the boundary. This is sort of turning the question backwards. Instead of starting with K and looking at elements of the C star algebra, I start with what might be an element of C star algebra and ask for which K is it actually in there? And that's of course very easy to answer. So, um, um, so for I less than or equal to N, it's one of these I's. I have certain elements that are the mu I. I only have two of these elements, right? Mu I and nu I. So let's let, um, if either one of them is a gamma, What's the largest superscript we get? So let's let um, Li be the maximum of um, those J at the mu I equals gamma I J or mu I. Or if neither of them is a gamma, then Li should be zero because I don't need a gamma there. Okay, so let's let um, M be the maximum of the I's such that Li is positive. And I can let um, then L is this um, sequence L1, L2. So on uh, up to LM, and then it's zero forever. So there's a new element of Y, an element that's only finitely non zero. And now we know that um, this element S mu, S mu star, belongs to. Um, the C star algebra of B1 lambda K infinite elements, if and only if Ki is greater than we get to Li for all I. That exactly says that K allows this choice that we need in order to build this element. So the question is, well, we know which case and why allow this element. What's the corresponding subset of the interval? So let's let um, D of L be pi of Instead of K and Y, 
Let's say kind of Ki greater than equal to Li. And I'd like to tell you what that is. I think this will um, make uh, the construction we have seems more natural. And of course, I'm showing you this because I like it. Um, there's a standard way of writing the half open interval um, that we use in, in sequences in calculus class. So this is um, zero to a half, this joint union, a half to two thirds. Let's just write this as the disjoint union, uh, say h greater than equal to zero of the half open interval from h over h plus one to h plus one over h plus two. Now, if we were to divide numerator and denominator by h, we get one over one plus one over h. It's a finite continuous fashion. Same thing here. Let's write this as. So the left endpoint is zero, one, H. And the right endpoint is zero, one, H plus one. Now the um, union over say um, H greater than or equal to L1 of these intervals, Okay, well now we're really just taking the tail of this, so it's just gonna go from here to one. So that's um, from bracket zero, one, H, one. Okay, now I'm gonna make a stab at the next stage, and I'll probably just write the general fact. Let's look at um, one of these intervals, so it's H over H plus one h plus one over h plus two. And we can write this as the exact same decomposition of this interval that we did for the unit interval before. This is the disjoint union for L greater than equal to zero. I'll say h plus L over L plus one over h plus one plus L plus one. And then we have H plus one, no, H, sorry. H plus L plus one over L plus two over H plus one plus L plus one. Now, what that is. So this is going to be a continued fraction zero one h one l. And this one will be the continued fraction zero one h one l plus one. So you can see that. Chopping up the unit interval in this way leads exactly to the kind of few fractions that showed up in those examples. So let me just end by writing the um, general situation. So this will be the um, greater than or equal to for I am less than M. Then we have half open interval whose um, endpoints are these continued fractions. So zero, one, K one, one, up to um, 
K1, Km minus one, one, and then Lm, and a similar thing here. Minus two, and then we have to use up a so the the longer our initial element s mu s nu star is, uh, the more finely we've chopped up the tiny little half open disjoint half open. Now. Um, I want to define um, uh, a bundle, right? So my bundle um, B is the um, disjoint union over T in F open interval of now what's the K is going to be the pi inverse of T. So whatever sequence used there. And this, of course, projects down onto the half open interval. So that's my bundle of C star algebras. And to get sections of the bundle, so I have F from, so I want F of T to be in this element S mu, S nu star. If, um, T belongs to this state, B of L, right? This funny disjoint union and zero otherwise. Right, I'm exactly using this element in those algebras where the element is defined, otherwise zero. So it's a very natural family of sections of this bundle. And I guess the theorem we've proven, though it's not um, preprinted yet. Um, is that the span of these Fs finds um, upper semi continuous C star bundle? So it turns out that continuous. Um, C star bundles correspond to continuous fields of C star algebras where the first um, ones defined. But people realized that upper semi continuity was really all you really needed to get good results. And so we're actually, from this construction, able to build such a thing, interpolating the F Roshan algebras with something that's elementary in the sense of being type one, even if it's not minute dimensional. And I'm just overdone my time now. I'm definitely stopping. Okay, so before we thank Jack for the beautiful six hours of lectures, maybe there are still some comments or questions. No, comment? But oh, so just uh, remind me the the fibers in this bundle. Um, so it's a difference between whether T is rational or irrational. They have different. Right, so at irrational numbers, it's really the approach number. Right, right. At the rational numbers, it's this extension of- That you don't know whether it's a graph algebra. I don't know, graph algebra, right, yeah. But that secondary question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but something that really interests me. Yeah. yeah. Independently of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, interesting. Yeah, so it's these funny algebras we put into the rational numbers to them. Um, right. That are our, our bundle. Right, right, okay. And I was wondering, uh, what do you mean when you say that upper semi-continuity is all you need to get good results? So, uh, so there's this notion of um, which result? P zero of x algebra. Yes. Yeah. An algebra with a uh, what a star homomorphism of C zero of x into the center of multipliers, and you then decompose the algebra over that space x in terms of the primitive ideal space of the C star algebra. And how about behavior uh, with respect to K-theory? Because I remember that this is a crucial tool used by people like Sergei Neshkayev. And uh, um, it, it, it's really nice when you 
try to determine the case theory has some continuous filter system address, get evaluation map, blah, blah, blah. You, you, I remember, I don't remember the details, but I remember some very strong arguments. Yeah, in so the theory derived from the fact that we have a continuous filter system yeah. Are you able to do the same metric here? Yeah, no, I haven't studied, I thought about this. For example, I had the following question. Uh -huh. If you have a continuous field of sister algebras, is the, are the K groups constant over the field? Mm -hmm. And I tried to write down the obvious proof and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. Okay. And I realized I don't know anything. <laughs> okay. But um, now I think that actually more is true. So, um, you know, these um, Efrochen algebras are read equivalent if and only if their continued fraction expansions are. Should tail of them, right? They have mm -hmm. the same tail as the one. So mm -hmm. there's an action of the uh, um, fractional linear transformations with integer coefficients, convertible two by two integer matrices, um, that allows you to move between the numbers. And I think there's a way of pushing that up to this bundle level and actually finding uh, in primitivity biomodules between the fibers that are more equivalent. Such a way that it covers that action of PGL2C on the base. And there I haven't written down all the details yet. But I've written enough to make me feel that it might be true. Um, it's sort of my, well, that's, uh, that's something I'm not working on now. Uh, uh, there's also um, a way of changing the rational fibers a little bit so that you actually get a continuous bundle. But then you're really no longer using. Well, so this algebra I defined at the rational numbers. How how important is the association between that algebra and that rational number? So if I use the algebra for a slightly different rational numbers, anybody really going to care? So there's a way of doing this and actually getting a continuous field instead of just upper space field. And that process works for the original one. So if there's a common subalgebra of these two finite dimensional things. That allows you to extend the original approach and algebra to be a continuous field. There are several different ways of doing this, and, uh, and I would like to know how they're all related to each other. So, definitely a lot of stuff still to think about. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank Jack for a beautiful six hours. I'll stop. Yeah, you have also some clapping hands here on Zoom, and I will now stop. Recording.